our Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, for uh, your goodness. We're grateful, dear God, for that which you long to do in our hearts. And yet, there's a resistance that has, or that is, seen in our own experience. The flesh constantly warring against the workings of the Spirit, desiring to be in harmony with you and yet striving, sometimes unconsciously, to be in harmony with the ways of the world. We find it uh, difficult to separate from this world. But Lord, we pray that you would work in us, both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Forgive us of our doubting spirit. Forgive us, Lord, of where we have not kept our hands in your hand. So, Lord, we pray that you would uh, come unto us as the early and the latter rain experience. For you said in the time of the outpouring of your spirit that we should ask. Father, we see the time um, like never before. So we don't have to put our experience in the future. But even now, Lord, we can ask, and so we do, that you would grant us your spirit to overcome this flesh, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, while we, uh, while we were just praying, a particular thought uh, came to mind, and I want to be able, I want to pull, I want to try to pull something up here. And you know what's interesting as I often mention here, that we don't follow a script, and so I don't mind looking a little um, unorthodox, if you will, uh, in grabbing books when uh, things come to mind. So I want to be able to, if I can, share this with you here. All right? And making sure I'm on because someone is calling. So I just want to make sure that everything is on. Now, I want us to notice this particular quotation as I uh, make reference to it um, in light of uh, where the Spirit uh, may lead us tonight in our study of God's Word. Um, lately, as of lately, a lot of things have been transpiring, um, not just in the nation, but in the world. If you remember this past closing Sabbath, we read a particular quotation taken from the book Great Controversy 606, where it says, In every generation, God sends his servants to rebuke sin in the world and in the church. And it says, And many reformers, while entering upon their work, they seek to exercise uh, great prudence in dealing with the sins of the world and the church and of the world. But it end, but the next part of that clause says, but when the Spirit of God come up, came upon them, they spoke as did Elijah. And the truths which they were reluctant to bring forth um, at, when they were seeking to be prudent, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, they brought these truths forth. And so I believe that as we see things transpiring, I believe many of us are seeking to be prudent. I believe that there is um, a, a filial connection that we have with one another. And, and, it, and it ought to be. We ought to have this brotherly love, Philadelphia, this brotherly love one toward another. And yet, the Bible tells us in the book of James that if we convert a sinner from the error of his ways, we, we hide a multitude of sins. And, and because of our connections with each other, we are the tendency to protect each other um, is there. And I believe that is something that we ought to cherish. Yet, we must search our hearts so that that filial connection does not cause us to unfit ourselves to be used by God in this crisis when he needs someone to stand between the porch and the altar, when he needs someone to stand between the living spiritually and the dead spiritually, when God needs someone to stand 
in the gap as he is searching for a man. We want to make sure that our filial connections does not unfit us to be used by God in this critical hour in which we uh, um, Bible-believing Christians find ourselves in as we deal with the issues of the church and as we deal with the issues of the world. So we have to be careful that that filial connection, which is something to be prized, does not hinder us um, in doing the will of God. That filial connection, it hindered Adam from being faithful to God. And so Adam again and Eve are again a type of where we are of the end of the world. We want to make sure that we do not repeat the sin of Adam by putting the church in the position where God and God alone ought to be. Because if we are going to be the savior of the body, of which Adam proved not to be, God calls us in Ephesians 5 a savior of the body. Matter of fact, look at that. Go to Ephesians 5. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians, the fifth chapter. I want us to notice, brothers and sisters, as we read this particular uh, quotation, uh, taking from uh, volume five of the testimonies, page 231. Notice what it says in Ephesians, the fifth chapter. And let's um, notice what the Bible says, Ephesians uh, chapter five. And let's start in verse 22, Ephesians five. And let's look at verse 22. And let's put these things in their uh, proper context. All right. Ephesians 5 and verse 22. The Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he, Christ, is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, let wives, let, so let the wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. All right, now let's look at this for a moment. So here the Bible calls Christ a savior of the body. Now we must understand that in, in a lesser light, if you want to use that, if we can use that word, you and I, in a sense, are to be the savior of of the body, not in the sense of absolving sins, not in the sense of, 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 of forgiven, forgiving, in a sense, someone of their sins against us and against God. Only Jesus is the only one mediator between man and God. But our saviorness, if I could use that word, of the body is described in James 5, as we mentioned a minute ago, as I made reference, but go there. And we're going to come back to here to Ephesians. Go to James, uh, Hebrews, James, James chapter five. Notice what the Bible tells us in James chapter five, beginning in verse 19. James five, beginning in verse 19. Now notice we find here that God gives you and I a ministry to be, in a sense, a savior of the body. He says, in another place, God says in um, Matthew, um, Matthew, I believe it is, ooh, hmm, who do men say that I am? I want to say Matthew uh, 17. Don't quote me on that. But uh, when Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, who do men say that I am? And he begins to talk about um, uh, uh, Christ or Peter. He refers to Peter. But then he says, upon this rock, will I build my church? And then he begins to tell them that whatsoever sins shall be remitted, those sins are remitted. So it doesn't necessarily give the church the, the, the authority. It doesn't give Peter or the disciples the authority to absolve sin as has been erroneously taught by, uh, by Catholicism. But God has placed the church 
the members in a position where they can be the savior of the body by correction, if you will, by standing against the, 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 uh, um, the encroachments of the enemy. As they see the enemy seeking to destroy the church, God's people are to raise up a standard because in that time when the enemy would come in like a flood, God does not lower the standard. God raises the bar. He, he, he wants to build the breach so that sin would not have access. The watchmen are to give a certain sound and the people are to take ready. If they refuse to take ready, they will perish. But God says we have freed ourselves from the guiltiness of their transgression, their hard heartedness. Notice what it says in James 5. It says, James 5, verse 19, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one what? Convert him. Let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his ways shall save the soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. So the Bible says, James says, listen, he says, brethren, if anyone errs from the truth, it says, and one convert him, just let him know you have converted a sinner, and you have saved the soul from death. So in one particular sense, God is calling upon us individually, collectively, to stand against the departing from the faith. It is mentioned in the book of Jude that we are to contend for the faith, my friends. And so therefore, our voices must be raised. A cry must be given. But as we read this last closing Sabbath message from Great Controversy 171, that God's choice of instrumentalities for reforming the church are the same that was seen in his planting. The Reformation will not come from the appointed leaders sadly, of the church. It did not come in any age, and it does not work and will not work in this our age. Now, that is not the purpose of our study. It is, again, to help us to understand that if we are going to be used by God, we must not allow our filial, our earthly, humanly love for each other in peril the cause of God because we do not want to hurt our brethren's feelings by pointing out their errors. But the Bible tells us that God was too much of a friend to remain silent while he saw the soul going down to the grave. He was too much of our friend to see the church perishing and those leading it to destruction doing what they were doing. He was too much their friend to remain silent. Brothers and sisters, we're not a friend of the cause if we can see this and we refuse to remain silent because we are concerned about our professional church careers, that we allow these things to continue to happen and we're more concerned about our shows on 3 ABN or our in our engagements at any other at any other Christian function that we remain silent so that we can continue to travel brothers and sisters we're not the, we're not the friend of sinners as we ought to be there has to be a separation not I'm not talking about a brethren there must be a separation individually from sin watch this quotation we're taking this from volume 5 231 as I was praying this particular quotation came before my mind it says a union with Christ by living faith is enduring again a union with Christ by living faith is enduring. 
every other union must perish. Watch this now. A union with Christ, a union with His Word, a union with doing the will of God by living faith is enduring. Every other union must perish, we are told. Christ first chose us, paying an infinite price for our redemption. And the true believer chooses Christ as first and last and best in everything. But this union cost us something. It is a union of utter dependence to be entered into by, pardon me, let me read that again. It is a union of utter dependence to be entered into by a proud being. All whom form this union must feel their need of the atoning blood of Christ. Watch this. They must have a change of heart. So the union with Christ by living faith is enduring. All other unions must perish. But we must keep in mind that this union with Christ, it will cost us something. There will be a sacrifice that will need to be made when the union is made with Jesus. Brothers and sisters, Adam did not understand. When he looked at Eve and said, Thou art bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Brothers and sisters, we did not understand that when we stood there in those white gowns, raising our hands to those vows, we did not understand when that pastor baptized us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And as we came forth to live a new life, we did not understand that one day that union may cost, that union with Christ may cost us friends in the very churches we were baptized in. Many as they stood there, Surrendering their hearts to God had no idea that this baptism would draw a wedge between a husband and a wife, a wedge between a father and a son, a mother and a daughter. Why? Because, not because the baptism led them away from them, but because the baptism became a signet that they were going to live for Jesus at all costs. And we did not believe that when we were baptized, that we would one day look at the church that we were baptized in and we will have to tell them, repent and believe the gospel. We never thought that we would have to tell ministers and our churches that you are in apostasy. We never had that on our minds. Adam never thought in a million years that he would have to have looked at Eve and rebuked her for her sins. He never thought that he would have to stand faithful to God if it cost the loss of that spouse. But because of his failure, he did not understand what Jesus, what Jesus had in store should he stood firm. He did not know that Jesus wanted to save, brothers and sisters. Often, we do not see God's love being exemplified in the manner that it could be because we are not willing to stand firm for the principles of God. We vacillate and we start thinking for God and in, 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 in carrying out God's plan. The union that you and I form with Jesus is going to cost us something. Let's go a little further. Let's go a little further. It says, they must have a change of heart. They must submit their own will to the will of God. There will be, follow the point now, there will be a struggle with outward and internal obstacles. 
there is going to be a struggle, not only with the forces on the outside, but there will be internal obstacles that we will have to struggle against. There are things in our lives that we did not anticipate we would have to surrender and you uniting ourselves with Jesus. But oh, my friends, as we draw closer to Christ, we began to realize that there are things that are in our lives that might have or that we thought were acceptable when we were not as close to Christ as we ought to have been or as he drew us to be. Now these things in our lives are starting to appear to be weights. They're starting to weigh our experience down. And as a result of coming closer to Christ, these things began to appear in their heinous light as they ought to appear. Notice what it says in Romans. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 7. Notice what it says. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, notice what the Bible says. Because the struggles that we have, if they were just with outside forces, brothers and sisters, these things can be easily won. All we would have to do <clears throat> is change our address and our problems could be finished. But our problems are not necessarily external by themselves. A lot of our external problems are created by our internal problems. Eve's external problems were created by an internal problem that she did not initially have, but she borrowed somebody else's trouble. She got herself in someone else's business and it became an internal struggle. Now here we find in Romans chapter seven, Romans chapter 7, the Bible says, Romans 7, verse 12. Romans 7, verse 12, the Bible says, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, Paul says, but sin, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me, by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding <clears throat> sinful. So as Jesus draws us to himself, sin starts to become exceeding sinful. Sometimes, we give up things in our experience and we give up things not because we hate it. Maybe it's an inconvenience. You know, maybe, maybe we find that, you know, I, I, I don't watch television because it, it's, it's an inconvenience to have cable and to, to go through all this. And so we give it up. But now everything is becoming more convenient. And so the old, big, heavy color TVs that we threw out, now we're able to carry around a little, no matter how big the flat screen is, it's still very light. I can move that back and forth. I can pin it up on the wall. So now it's not that inconvenient. And what happens, <clears throat> what we thought we had victory over wasn't really victory. It was just inconvenient, and so we moved it out of the way. But because the soul remained swept and empty, <coughs> excuse me, Satan was able to come back in this latter day with seven spirits more wicked than himself. And now our latter state or our present state is worse than at the beginning. And we're finding this in society and we're finding it in the church. In our latter state, brothers and sisters, we're finding things in the church worse today than at the beginning of the church's experience. Because we're de we've departed from things out of con inconvenience. But now that sin has become convenient for us, we have welcomed it back into the churches. 
back into our hearts. And brothers and sisters, you must understand this. What we are seeing at the church is nothing more than the outgrowth of what is in the heart. The church is made up of individual families. And if the church is in a chaotic, wild, uncouth condition, it is because the heart of man has, is waxing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So our churches that we see in this condition are nothing more than the outgrowth of the abominable acts that are taking place in the human heart. The heart has gone, has because the heart, the Bible tells us um, in the book of Psalms, I believe it's 105, when the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt, the Bible says they were not estranged. Or in other words, they were not divorced from their lust. They changed positions, but their condition remained the same. Yes, they walked through the water. Yes, they were under the cloud in the, uh, uh, and in the fire, but they were not divorced. They were not estranged from their lust. And so those things that we thought we left over there, they're now here. They have now taken up residence. Why? Because they were just inconveniences. But now it's convenient for them to be here. So notice, Paul says that as we come to Christ, the law of God, it shows us our sins. They become more magnified as we draw closer to Jesus. So here, the statement that we're reading is, is that the heart must be given to Jesus. We read that the, 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 the struggle is not just external, but it is actually internal. Watch this. It says, there must be, now this is the part, brothers and sisters, there must be a painful work of detachment as well as a work of attachment. The pain for work of detaching and attaching. The painful work. We must, uh, th there must be a, a separation from the things of this world and there must be the engrafting in into the will of God. And what are we grafting? We're surrendering. We don't want to surrender. We spent our whole lives trying to become independent, trying to be on our own, make our own decisions. And now coming to Jesus, he says, you must be born again. Our whole life, we've been prepared for independence. And now God is saying you have to become dependent. So not only is separation painful, but attaching ourselves to Jesus brings pain. Because that attachment causes us to be out of harmony with the world and sadly with many in the church. It's causing us to not be able to feel comfortable in places of worship where we used to go to. Before we had no problem with the praise team in their scantily covered dresses. We, you know, we kind of ignore that. We didn't pay that much attention. But as we come closer to Christ, we're starting to know, say, wow, you know, this is becoming alarmingly um, 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 uncomfortable. As I can look at my children now starting to starting to mold and reflect that spirit that I see, I'm starting to notice. And all of a sudden now, because you've been studying, you've been reading you're not just listening to sermons, but you're actually reading the Bible. You're actually reading the Spirit of Prophecy and you're becoming uncomfortable with the way that things are being done in the church. You're starting to become a little unsettled with, with the messages that, that, that the pastor and, and things that he will not say and things that he is saying. You're starting to become along with this. And there's some discomfort because now you're seeing that, Lord, there is a detaching that must take place if I'm going to remain faithful to God. There must be a detaching. And brothers and sisters, don't, don't, don't let anybody make you believe that you must be in an environment 
that is spiritually threatening to your experience, while those individuals do not sit in those environments, and if they do sit in those environments, it is only because, it is only because they need a reference so that they can continue to do what they're doing. That, brothers and sisters, is something that I believe that many are starting to wake up and take notice of. Wait a minute. Are you telling me that I am to take my children, who I'm trying to raise in the fear and admonition of the Lord, you're trying to tell me that souls that I'm studying with, that I'm showing the truth, that I'm to take them into these environments and, 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 and jeopardize everything that I've studied with this individual so that I do not appear to be an independent Adam when I know by the, by, when I know that by the word of God that I'm standing for the truth. So I am to, I am to jeopardize my spirituality and those around me for the sake of appearing to be something. When these individuals who are masquerading themselves as seven Adventists are not called to hold up a peculiar standard, brothers and sisters, we're deceiving ourselves. And the sad thing is that many who would tell you to be in these churches only, and I capitalize O-N-L-E, they only go to those churches so that they can get a reference so that they can keep traveling to other places. So when someone says, what church you go to, they want to be able to have a reference. They don't want to be able to say, well, no, I don't go to that particular church. No, my wife and I, we attend a local congregation that is not um, um, uh, uh, endorsed by the conference. They won't be able to travel. And if they're not able to travel, then guess what? They will be forced to do a work locally for which they can receive no honor but from the honor of God. But they don't want God's honor. They want man's honor. So as you begin to study and as you begin to see like this, you realize that, man, this is a painful work of detaching and attaching. Watch this. It says pride, selfishness, vanity, worldliness, sin, and all its forms must be overcome if we would enter into a union with Christ. Last part, the reason why many find the Christian life so deplorably hard, why they are so fickle, so variable, is that they try to attach themselves to Christ without first detaching themselves from these cherished idols. They want to say they believe in present truth, but they don't want to deny this worldliness. They don't want to lift their voices against it because should they go on record and saying that this is sin, then you know what happened? 3ABN might get, uh, may, 3ABN may get wind of the fact that they said something was sin and they show might be canceled. So they don't want to go on a record and saying what sin is anymore. They just want to have an even tone so that they can keep selling their goods and products in the church. Money changes is what they're called. But brothers and sisters, again, our emphasis is this union with Christ. And as we make this union, there is going to be a painful work of detaching and attaching itself to Christ. Notice, I want us to notice what it says. Go in our Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews um, chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And we're going to uh, skip around and then we're going to go to chapter 4. All right. I'm going to bring emphasis out on chapter 4. Now, brothers and sisters, I want us to understand something. How inconvenient leaving Egypt was for the Israelites. Because many times we look back and we are told that we should let our imagination grasp the scenes of the Word of God. We should meditate in it day and night. And as we think about the wanderings and the journeys of the Israelites, we find that leaving Egypt was not humanly practical in its fullest sense, logical, 
and it was inconvenient. It was at an inconvenient time and the necessary preparations humanly were not made for success in the wilderness. So when we think about the children of Israel leaving Egypt, again, not in a human sense, it wasn't practical. It wasn't logical. And it came at an inconvenient season. And so you must understand that what God is asking us individually, collectively as families, collectively as churches, God is asking, what God is asking us is not in the human sense, it's not practical, it's not logical, and often the call comes at an inconvenient time. It comes at an inconvenient time. And I've told you before of, of, of my wife and I coming here. It wasn't practical to people who, who did not have that eye salve, who were not praying and listening for the voice of God. It wasn't practical to them because they told my wife it wasn't practical. They tried to discourage her because they knew I wasn't going to listen to them. But it wasn't practical. It wasn't logical. It didn't make sense to them because they've never made any sacrifices for God of that particular source. They have never really committed their ways to God. And if they did, they've lost their first love and they don't know what it's like to make a commitment to God. And it came at an inconvenient time. And so when we understand how God is leading this people, brothers, it's not going to be practical to everyone. Thus, you must search the word of God for yourselves. I don't know how many times I've said it. I don't know how many times I can continue to say it, <clears throat> but I will. And that is you must read. You must read. You must read. You must read. You must study the word of God. You must grab the testimonies of God's spirit and you must open them up. <clears throat> You must take your Bibles and you must study these things through the same way. If you were just to take the Old Testament, if someone was to take the Old Testament by itself with no spiritual understanding, they will be led to believe that we still need to be sacrificing. But if you put the Old Testament with it and you see God's system of truth, you will recognize, wait a minute. No, 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 no. That's what God, not what God is asking us to do. And you'll be able to see the progression of truth. Jesus, the apostles, the prophets, they saw the progression of truth in their time. They didn't see the full truth, but they saw the progression of truth. But in every instance, the great majority did not see the progression of truth. And they remained stuck in a rut and they persecuted God's chosen or appointed servant for that hour. And we see the same thing today. Many say, well, I'm a faithful Seventh-day Adventist. I'm a faithful Christian. And they are the very ones who are stuck in a rut, who are persecuting the faithful servants of God. You are going to find yourself being persecuted as one who sees the progression of truth and that you stand for it. But you have to, again, don't allow your, this is why we have to get rid of pride. We read it. This is why we got to get rid of pride, selfishness, vanity, worldliness, and sin, and all of its forms. We must not allow our pride, our selfishness, our, our vanity, or worldliness, or sin in all its forms, to remain in the soul, because if we are, then by and by, we're going to become offended when, when persecution comes. When people start saying, well, I think you're fanatical, you're going to get offended because of that. And before you know it, you're going to, you know, you're going to, tink, you're going to sneak your way back in like, like, uh, um, uh, have mercy. I always say the man's name, but it was Elisha's uh, servant. You know who it is, Gehazi. You're going to find yourself like Gehazi sneaking back in. I've heard many people, yeah, you know, I tried to go to, uh, um, I tried to go to uh, non-conference churches, you know, but they didn't have the Spirit of God as if the Spirit of God is with them now where they are now. As if the Spirit of God is in the church where they are now. And you hear it, you're going to hear it. Yeah, you know, I've tried that, but you know, you know, huff and puff and whatever. Brothers and sisters, you have to, those type of things, you have to be able to move aside. 
You know, you're going to find people that try to ask you questions just to twist you. Brothers and sisters, you have to move it aside. They must be born again. You have to learn to move those things aside. Don't allow your pride and your desire to be right and to win an argument lead you to utter things that do not bring glory to God. We're not called to win arguments, brothers and sisters. We're called to preach the gospel. Don't cast your pearls before swine. You say what the Lord would have you to say, brothers and sisters, you move on. Those who are open for truth, they're longing for guidance, those are the ones that angels are impressing. So if someone is not open to the truth, they're not longing for guidance, and brothers and sisters, why stand there and beat that un and beat that unfruitful tree? Why sit there and shake a tree where it's, it's, it has no fruit? The fruit are green. It's not open for truth. It's not longing for guidance. Why we should go to those who are open for the truth? Go to those who are longing for guidance. People say stuff a lot of times. Oh, pastor, you're not being godly. Those who are open for truth, longing for guidance, you continue to move on. You can't allow these terms and, and, and what people say hinder you from doing what God is asking you to do. You must preach the truth, leave the results with God. Search your heart. Lord, surrender your pride, your selfishness, your vanity, your worldliness, and continue to cry aloud, spare not. Show God's people their sins so that they can be saved. Don't be concerned about the stonings that is going to come. Brothers and sisters, as Brother Hay would say, charge it to the cross. When things go, oh, you know, hey, take it out, charge it to the cross. Swipe it on the cross and keep moving. Jesus takes that for us. The thorns that we would have to pass through, Jesus has passed through before and has pressed them down with his feet. Move in his path and don't be concerned, but make sure that the union between you and Christ has been formed. As you come closer to Christ, the desire to surrender, the desire to see more faultiness in your own character, that shows that you're coming to Christ. But if you... Are, are impressed by your own spirituality, that is a sign that you are the furthest of anyone else away from Jesus. How am I to make the surrender to God? You are to surrender your will, not once, not twice, but this commitment to God is to be renewed at every advanced step towards heaven. You keep renewing the soul to Christ. Oh, I'm being you fanatical. Continue to move forward, brothers and sisters. Continue to be the example. Notice Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3. Once you notice the point now, Hebrews chapter 3, children of Israel, their walk, not practical, not logical, not in a convenient season. It did not come at a convenient time. Neither the call that God placed with us. But we must remember that there is something that God has for us, but we can miss it just like the children of Israel miss it. And brothers and sisters, sadly to say, a great majority are going to miss it. A great majority are going to miss what God has called for them. Because not because God arbitrarily has decreed that a large class depart from the faith, but God sees that they are not estranged from their lusts. You want to know how you know? Just look at the condition of the churches. Look at what's happening in the churches, brothers and sisters. When I, it's, you know what is interesting? It's interesting in society today that everything that people have pretended not to be Facebook is declaring that this is what they really are. Facebook says, hey, hey, I know what they've been saying they're not, but hey, this is what they really are. Just look at their page. Look at what they like to do. Look at their attire. Look, look, look at the person. And you can see that that person is in need of your prayers and sympathies many times than your rebukes. Because spiritually, you see that they are destitute and they're longing for something better. Notice, brothers and sisters, Hebrews 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Here's uh, uh, Paul uh, speaking uh, not to them in the wilderness anymore, but actually this is really for us in this our day. Notice what it says in Hebrews 3. And I'll start in verse... 
Verse 7. Then there's a lot to be said, but verse 7, for sake of time. It says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you would hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Provocation means striving in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do what? Always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. Wait a minute. Let's back up for a moment. Back up to verse 9 again. It says, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works. But then it says in verse 10, they erred in their heart and they did not know his ways. Wait a minute. They saw it. They read it. But they didn't understand it. They did not embrace it to where it actually became a part of their lives. They tolerated it where they could and where they didn't want to tolerate it anymore, they sought to change it. Watch the point. In the wilderness, they saw God open the Red Sea. They saw God rain down. They knew God rained manna. God had a pillar of cloud above the day, pillar of fire by night. God gave them water out of a rock. God allowed quail to come. God, uh, God destroyed uh, uh, um, Pharaoh and the Red Sea. God uh, uh, caused the ground to open up and remove Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. God allowed the fiery serpents to come in, and then God saved the people who were bitten. They saw the works of God. God spoke to them from Mount Sinai. They heard the voice. God wrote it on His Ten Commandments. God gave them His statute and His laws. <clears throat> he instructed them. He guided them, the Bible says in Isaiah 63, by His Spirit. God spoke to them through the similitude of the prophets. God, God led them out by a prophet. They saw all these words, but they did not know God's ways. Why? Because they tolerated it because they had to. As long as Moses was around, they tolerated it. But when they, when they found an inconvenience, a, a convenient time, they changed it. Brothers and sisters, we must understand that we have tolerated these three angels' messages on our churches. But when we could change it, we changed it. We tolerated the preaching of standards. But when we don't have to tolerate it, we're not tolerating it anymore. These pastors today and members, I must say, are not tolerating it anymore. Yes, they've read it, but they're not tolerating the spirit of prophecy anymore. Yes, they, 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 they had it. They know what it says, but they're not willing to tolerate it anymore. They are going to do what they want. This is what happened in the wilderness, and this is what is happening in the church now. They are no longer tolerating. They had to tolerate those things because of the, what they call the old brood. This is what Ty Gibson calls the old brood. They're not tolerating the old brood anymore. They're going to have their way. You want to know they're going to have their way? Because 3ABN will continue because of their desire to be seen. 3ABN will continue to put out this out these messages that are destroying the church. That God had moved upon Mr. Shelton to build up the church. Now the very engine, it has become the very engine to tear down the church with these messages that we're seeing being broadcast from its, from its satellites. Brothers and sisters, it is a fearful time. It is no time to talk in ambiguous terms about this and that. Brothers and sisters, it is time to lay the ax to the root. These things are the things that are destroying the church. Brothers and sisters, they are destroying God's church. But we have to, but again, we have to make sure the union is formed because this generation no longer wants to tolerate but Paul was warning in Hebrews 3, Hebrews 4, he was warning, brothers and sisters, that a day would come with his people that there would be no more toleration. 
when the book of Hebrews was written, it was a few years before, brothers and sisters, it was a few years before the destruction of Jerusalem was about to take place. We're told in great controversy that the destruction of Jerusalem was a type of the destruction at the end of the world. Here we are symbolically moving again towards that crisis. And these writings, brothers and sisters, from the writings of Paul, stand out in clear tones that God's people must repent and they must recognize that Jesus is the only one that could take away our sins. Notice, he says, Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart as the men did in the wilderness, verse 11, so I swear in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exalt one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So here the Bible says, exalt one another. Exalt one another to do what? To do right in the eyes of God. Reprove, rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine. This is how we exalt the church, not by patting people on the back, not by giving out awards to, to Hollywood producers in the church. No, that's not how we do it. That's not how we exalt one another. We don't exalt one another by by, by speaking encouragement when we see people are living in sin and they're leading people down the road to sin. That's not how we encourage. That's not how we exalt one another in the truth. We ought to provoke each other to good works, it says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. We ought to 23, 24, and 25. We ought to provoke one another to good works. This is how we exalt one another while it is called today, lest we be hardened. Notice, let's keep going. It says... Verse 14, verse 13, but exalt one another daily while it's called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the what? Deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ. If, here it is, for we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, if we hold our confidence, hold the beginning of our confidence. Wait a minute, brothers and sisters. We are partakers of Christ if we hold. So if we're departing from the faith and giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, we are not partakers of Jesus. We are not partakers of Christ with all of these things that we're seeing in the church. And just because it has the FDA label on it because it has the stamp of the SDA on it. Yes, I said FDA, but I'm again, I want to give you an understanding that just because it has a stamp does not mean that it is approved or it is fit for food. Doesn't mean that it is fit for spiritual consumption just because it comes with the stamp upon it. Brothers and sisters, how can we place confidence in these lines when we see them moving in such a dangerous condition? Oh, let me, I didn't mean to go here, but um, uh, I am going to go here anyway, if I can do it. Because I, I, I told you before, we're glad that we don't follow a script here um, so we can kind of veer a little bit off track if we need to. All right. Notice what it says. See if I could find this for us real fast. Uh, see if we can uh, get this. And if we can't, we'll move on. I'm not going to belabor the point. Um, and maybe I'll read it this closing Sabbath, just so you uh, just so you can see what we're talking about. Hmm. Let's see. Hmm. 
Hmm. All right, well, I can't find it just yet. We'll, uh, we'll move on. But notice, so what it says, how can we emplace, and the, the point I was bringing out is, how can we emplace our endorsements upon things that we see are leading us away from the truth? We are partakers of Christ if it says, if it says in verse, where were we? We were in verse 14, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, verse 15, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, they did provoke. How be it? Not all came out of Egypt. How? By Moses. How be it? That many who provoked and caused this striving were not moved by the spirit that moved Moses. Wait a minute. You're telling me that the spirit that moves Moses, which was a prophet, you mean to tell me that many of those who provoked and brought in this type of chaos and worship did not accept the spirit of prophecy as the voice of God to the people? Oh, yes, there were leaders, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. They were the ones that said, wait a minute, all God's people are holy. We don't need these writings. We don't need this. All God's people are holy. Are we not hearing and seeing that now? Are we not hearing that, 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 that we don't need these things? These things are not, brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. We are about to vote again and place God's spirit. We are about to, again, if we thought Jesus was making his way back in the church. Brothers and sisters, he is about to be kicked totally out of the church. But yet... Minds, regardless of what Eve does, they're still going to take that fruit out of Eve's hand. They're going to take it and they're going to eat the fruit, fruit out of Eve's hand. Regardless of what Eve does, regardless of what she says, she, yes, I got it from the serpent. Yes, I studied spiritual formation. Yes, I went to a Baptist seminary. Yes, I went to a Presbyterian seminary. Yes, I've done all these things. Yet, I am your pastor and you must listen to me. And brothers, sit down. Yes, I committed adultery. Yes, what are you going to do about it? Because of your loyalty to Eve, you are going to sit and take the fruit of the serpent. And this is what people are doing every single week. How do you know? Because when they come on Facebook, they sound like they've been eating at the serpent's house. They, they sound just like they have been eating from the serpent's hand. And this is what they're doing. They're supporting the serpent's doctrines. But here, as we end, the Bible says, they didn't all come out by Moses, verse 17. But with whom was he grieved for the years? Was it not with them that sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believe not, so we, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Verse, chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, Less, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preach did not profit them, not being mixed with faith. In them that heard it. In other words, when they looked at the Word of God, they did not understand its spiritual power. They accepted the legat. They accepted a legal religion. That's what they are. They are legally binding Seventh Day Adventists. Many of us today are in the church where legally we have accepted a legal religion, but its spirit and its power we will deny 
until probation close. Why? Because our legal religion does not allow us to accept a spiritual power. Our legal religion does not allow us to accept a spiritual power. And as a result of that, the gospel was constantly being preached to them. 40 years they were hearing it. 40 years they were hearing the gospel. In that cloud was the gospel. In that fire was the gospel. That rock that followed them was the gospel. Moses, when he spoke the gospel, everything, the manna was the gospel. Everything Jesus did for them in the wilderness were attributes of the gospel. They heard it. Paul says in Acts 13, he says the scriptures that were read every Sabbath, they fulfilled in rejecting Jesus. So they're hearing it. We're hearing it. But our legal religion does not allow us to accept a spiritual power. And so we're fighting against the Word of God. We're fighting against truth in all its forms. Why? Because we have not merged self into Jesus and our pride, our selfishness, our vanity, and our worldliness and sin in all of its forms still exist in our lives. We have brought our worldly practices into the church. Many of us today only have ministries in the church because we, had, we were professionals in the world. And our Wall Street, our, our uh, uh, whatever business we used to work for, we were either rappers or R&B singers or wannabe rappers or wannabe R&B singers. And, you know, we were either athletes or we were doctors. We, we were something. You know, just being a sinner coming to Christ was not good enough. But we were something. And we use that as our, as we use that as our, as, as our uh, 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 application, if you will. Our resume. We use that as our resume for getting a ministry in the church. But we're no longer more fit for ministry than the pews that occupy the church that we sit upon every Sabbath. But the only reason you're recognized is because, hey, you can bring some clout to the church. Because, yeah, you used to work on Wall Street. Yeah, you used to be some big-time executive. But you have no more burden for the work than those pews have. And so here we are in a fearful condition. But we have not surrendered our pride. And God says, let us fear. Let's say promise left for us, because there's a promise for us that we can come into Christ's rest. But our legal religion won't accept it. Why? Because I say, Pastor, I hear everything you're saying, but you're not a part of the conference. You're not a part of my legal religion. I don't, you know, you, you attend worship somewhere that is not legally accepted by my legal religion. And so because my legal religion does not legally allow me to legally accept you, I can't, I reject. But brothers and sisters, it causes pain because you realize it's not about you. When the critics roll, brothers and sisters, they're not going to see me. They're going to see God was speaking. They're not going to see Andrew Enriquez. They're not going to see Pastor Kofer. They're not going to see Lloyd Grubb. They're not going to see Kenny Armstrong. They're not going to see some of you who 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 uh, uh, less name, but yet you're still standing for spiritual power. You're still standing for the truth. You're still proclaiming the truth. Many of you come on the Facebook page and 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 you give some profound truth. Lamar Molden and all, I mean, you give some profound. You say some profound things that causes people to think. You're blessing people in other places. Many people may not know who you are, but you're blessing people in other places. I may not know you, that's fine, but God knows you, and you're blessing people in other places. And you're standing for the truth. So, but because of the legal religion that many people accepted, they say, I can't accept that. So they're not going to see you in the end. They're going to see Jesus. They're not going to see your name. You, you reject. No, they're going to see that you rejected the message of God. Ellen White is not even going to be reckoned in your judgment. 
God is going to show you that you rejected His Spirit. This is, this is the only thing that should cause us sadness. Not the fact that our relatives don't accept who we are and they, they think we're fanatical and we're a little extreme. And that, that should not phase you one iota. Surrender that to Jesus. But the thing that should cause you to be sad is you realize, wow, they're rejecting the Spirit of God. And that's what they're going to have to answer to. That's what they're going to have to deal with. And thus, but again, do not shake the unfruitful trees. Yes, Jesus says, I'm going to tarry long with it. But go to those who are open for truth and longing for guidance. Leave them with God. Leave them with God and you go to those who are open for it. And this is what we must be focused on. On. Brothers and sisters, as we close tonight, I want to thank you uh, again for your time, a much anticipated time that we have together. This coming Sabbath, as always, our Sabbath morning manna, which is at 730 and we come together just for a half an hour because we know you have many other things and places to go uh, for Sabbath and, and you go places, you do Bible studies, you go and share. So at 730. Sabbath morning, uh, we come together for a uh, devotional from the Word of God from 7.30 to 8, and then we come back at 11.30, and then again at 4.30 for our closing Sabbath message. Um, throughout this week, for the rest of the week, uh, uh, you, many of you have been watching Pastor Kofer's uh, Health uh, Revival. Continue to enjoy them. May God bless you. Let us have a word of prayer. And by God's grace, 7.30 Sabbath morning for our Sabbath morning manner.